everyone here. Yeah. Some better than others. <laughs> <laughs> some, some, are, some are even coming from Paris, I see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow, international crowd. I think uh, we'll have guests also from uh, Greece. From I, Crete. I, I, well, Greece, that, Greece. From Greece, okay. That sounds good. All right. So? Yeah. Um, and uh, do, do you know Anat Peek? She's also here. She's featured yeah, well, on Ubu Web. We have her, we have her Ursonata up on Ubu. Uh, we yeah. have her Ursonata up on Ubu Web. Of course I know yeah, her. So, so she's a, above you on my screen. I don't know if, if you know I know. I can't, I can't quite figure I, this out. I don't thing. want to, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm saying she's here. I'm not saying what's her neck or anything. But, yes, yes. No, she's, she's, she's a hero. I met her in Israel and she came up and, uh, and, and told me about, I mean, I actually knew her work, but uh, then she gave us stuff for Ubu Web and it was amazing. Yeah. And I wrote down to, to mention her uh, during the talk. Uh, okay, well, we've already mentioned good her. That we, uh, Maybe this is not official, but, but we love her. Yeah, uh, we sure do. We adore her. As a matter of uh, fact, I, I sh I've uh, written about, I think I've written about her in, in uh, the new book. Uh, I've actually mentioned her anyway, not, if not written about. Okay, so we'll see about that. Um, and uh, I see that uh, uh, Noah from the festival is here and she's uh, hey. as excited as I am. Maybe Hello. more. Maybe Hello, more. <laughs> hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Isn't this horrible? What, the corona? No, Zoom. <laughs> yes, it's quite, it's quite horrible. The, the corona's great compared to the Zoom. Is someone recording this? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, so you see, I've got the background with some of your books that got into my gray Wow, you've got a great, background. great collection there. Yeah, it, it's the rarities, you know. Yeah, well, they're all rare. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we specialize in rare things. Of course, uncontested spaces. Uncontested spaces, unpopular culture. Yeah, and th there are a lot of people here, I think, from the workshop or people who yeah, are right. related to yours. I don't know if you recognize uh, Alex Benary. Uh, I, I recognize them all. It was, I, I, was in, I was in Israel in what, 2013? Yeah. That's a long time ago already. Yeah. I'm here too. Karen, did you hear Karen? Yeah, hey, I heard her. I heard her scream. Thank you for the beautiful books, Karen and Iran. They're gorgeous. Uh, thank you. Uh, in Arabic, uh, they say the word bujudak, which means in your presence. You know, in your presence, they're, they're great. Well, they, I have them all. Um, and, and that funny one with that little essay about you in the library reading room is incredible. Uh, you know, the first thing, there, there are a lot of my students here, and the first thing I tell them about you is the story where there was a, an open mic on uh, the second floor of a museum or some kind of institute. No, that's and a theory. You, would, you oh, like me to read, would you like me to read that poem? That's yes, of course. Uh, okay, let me find it. Uh, I can read that. We can start. That can be part of our poetry reading. Yeah, why not? Poetry that doesn't sound like poetry. That's what we like. 21st century poetry. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know. Uh, hold on a sec. Let me, let me find this here. My mother is also here. <laughs> you, I'm, I'm, I, don't know, I don't know what to say about that. Okay. You can recognize her by the uh, positioning of the camera. <laughs> okay. So yes. Can? <laughs> Okay, um, do you want me to start with that reading? I, I don't know, there's like, Noah is the bot here, so, so okay. she... Okay, yeah. oh, yes. So, Iran, I, I pulled that up, so we can, we can do that one. Okay, that so we'll start. I will say good evening, uh, my name is Noah Shakarji, I'm the Artistic Director of the Poetry Place International Zoom Festival, along with Gilad Miri is here, Gilad, say hello. Hello, hi. Oh, hi, hey. Gilad. Hey. 
And I welcome you all. I'm honored and excited to welcome Kenneth Goldsmith and Iran Adas. Uh, one of Kenneth's books, they just talked about it, is the book Theory. And uh, on a personal note, a few years ago, I have it here. I wanted to buy the book, um, but the shipping to Israel was very, very expensive. So in my visit to New York, I had the book in my cousin's house. And when I went to pick it up, I found it torn. Uh, my cousin couldn't understand <laughs> what uh, was so important about this stack of paper that I had shipped to her instead of buying it at Office Depot. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, my story with, <laughs> with this book. Uh, I will say a few words about Iran and then he will introduce Kenneth as Iran is one of the leading poets in Israel. He published eight poetry books, Algorithms and Robots, one of them under the name Lisette. He is a lecturer for algorithmic and uncreative poetry. And before we'll start, uh, just uh, some technical information. Your microphones will be muted during the conversation, but we will dedicate the last 10 minutes to your questions. Uh, you can also write us in the chat book during the conversation and we will try to assist you the best we can. And now I give the stage to Iran and Kenneth and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Noah. Uh, thank you, Poetry Place. Uh, I love Poetry Place. I'm, I've been teaching there since it, your inception, uh, basically. And I would like to thank uh, Noah and Gilad, uh, Ayelet Ashachar, uh, especially Atara and Aviv for uh, making this happen and uh, giving me the honor and the pleasure of hosting Kenneth Goldsmith. And now I have to read uh, the paragraph about Kenneth, but you'll see that it's much more than that. Kenneth Goldsmith is an American poet and critic from New York City. His rich bibliography includes conceptual poetry books such as They, The American Trilogy, you can see in the background, uh, Sport, Traffic and Weather, and Capital. Some of his literary criticism titles are Uncreative Writing, Wasting Time on the Internet, and Theory. He is the founding editor of Ubu Web and is a senior editor of Penn Sound at the University of Pennsylvania, where he teaches. He was invited by the Obamas to the White House, where his reading became viral. He was also the first poet laureate at the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York City. But more important for me, he's just my favorite poet and perhaps the first distinct poet of the 21st century. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, hi, Kenneth, how are you? Hi, Let's something. Let me drink something. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all for uh, showing up in this abysmal medium. Yeah, so, um, I guess that uh, there are a lot of people here who contacted me and said, uh, we love uh, Kenneth and we want to be here, for, but for those who aren't there, uh, aren't uh, familiar with you, um, would you like to say something about yourself or talk about a work of yours or anything like that before we start? Well, I don't know. I mean, haven't we started? I think we started before the beginning, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I like informality. Very formal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but we did dress up, and that's like one of the most. I important. think it's important. I mean, I see so many of these Zoom things where people are in their underwear, and you can find the most glamorous. I mean, maybe that's that, that's incredible, but but um, you know, I think that this is one of the things is that people, even in real life, don't understand that poetry. Uh, on the stage or anywhere you are is a performance. People think that somehow uh, getting up on a stage is, is authentic, an authentic act, when in fact it's completely inauthentic and even presenting oneself as being authentic is an act of inauthenticity. And this is never theorized, particularly by poets who, who, who for, for at, at, at any price um, savor some strange old fashioned notion of authenticity. If I was being myself right now, you wouldn't want to see me. I promise you. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, now performance artists are struggling with uh, carrying out performance performances on the internet uh, via Zoom. And then it's really like real life because 
they are doing the same thing, staying at home, just like the audience. So, well, you know, I'm I'm from New York, and I live in New York City. Every time you walk out your door, it's a performance. Yeah, right. You know, that's why people in New York dress the way that they do. Um, and it is, the streets are beautiful and, and we're very self-conscious that you can't go out to the grocery store in your pajamas. And the worst thing is, is that people, um, I've noticed that, that a new trend in New York in the warm months is for men to jog through the city without shirts on. I think that's very uncouth. Oh, it's disgusting, uh, really, in, in, in New York to do such a thing. Uh, great. I, I just want to say that we, uh, I see in the chat window that uh, we have also audience from Spain, which I cannot see uh, on camera, but I see on the chat window. And uh, people can eat throughout the, the, the meeting and please write in English if you can, so Kenneth can also understand. Uh, I think that uh, it's time to read something, unless you want to uh, fetch the the, the text that I mentioned. Sure, uh, but you can't translate it in, he in Hebrew, can you? Uh, I've got it. The, um, no, I'll just... translate it as it goes, because there is a formal translation, but I'll, I'll just... Do you want me to do that? Or we, we yeah, just sure. Something that we planned on doing. And then I'll share my uh, presentation, right? That's what the guys here. Yeah. Okay, well, okay. so you, you want me to just read the thing? Yeah, so this is, uh, if you're my student, uh, sorry. Oh, you're not gonna simultaneously translate it. No, no, uh, I, I'll just say that if you're my student, that's like your first encounter with uh, Kenneth Goldsmith. And uh, it's like more of a story, so uh, I don't know whether, well, we'll see about that. Okay. Okay, D just okay, go ahead. The from theory. Yeah. Uh, at Tony Hauser's retrospective, at the Williams College Museum of Art. Upstairs, buried deep within the galleries, the artist had set up a microphone into which anybody could step up and speak. What they said would be broadcast into the entrance atrium of the museum. There were no restrictions on what you could say, only a small note reminding the speaker to be sensitive of others and a gentle suggestion to refrain from swearing. When it was my turn, I said in my clearest and most radio-like voice, <clears throat> May I have your attention? May I have your attention? The museum is now closing. Please make your way to the exit and thank you for visiting. Although it was hours away from closing time, I repeated the announcement again and saw on the video monitor that was provided people streaming toward the exit. Again, I made my announcement. At once a frantic elderly guard came running up to me, grabbed my arm and said, you're not allowed to say that. When I told him there was nothing prohibiting me from saying it, he again told me that I wasn't allowed. Why, I asked. Because it's not true, he replied. You must stop saying that now. Of course, I repeated my announcement once again. And this poor man was really struggling with what to do with me. He knew that while I wasn't breaking any real laws, by questioning the institution's authority, I was breaking an unwritten social contract. Okay, I, I found the, the translation. I'll just close the window. You have to, you have to say the voices like I did. Of course. <laughs> uh, so this is how it goes in Hebrew. And then there's the question, how does it feel to hear your text uh, read in a different language? But later. Betawhat retrospectiva shenelcha l'atsalam Tony Hauser קרוב משפחה של צבי, במוזיאון האומנות של מכללת וויליאמס, בקומה העליונה, קבור עמוק בין הגלריות, הוצב מיקרופון שאליו יכול היה כל אחד לעלות ולדבר. המארגנים כתבו שכל מה שייאמר אל תוך המיקרופון יושמע בשידור חי בתוך חלל הכניסה של המוזיאון. לא הוטלו מגבלות ביחס למה מותר או אסור לומר, למעט הודעה קטנה שהזכירה לדוברים שעליהם להיות רגישים לאחרים, ובקשה מנומסת להימנע משימוש בקללות. כשהגיע תורי, אמרתי בקול הצלול ביותר והרדיופוני ביותר שהצלחתי לסגל לעצמי, קהל נכבד, אבקש את תשומת לבכם, קהל נכבד, אבקש את תשומת לבכם, המוזיאון נסגר אך שב. הנכם מתבקשים להגיע אל היציאה, אנו מודים לכם על הביקור. 
חרף העובדה שנותרו עוד שעות עד סגירת המוזיאון, חזרתי על ההודעה בשנית. וראיתי בצג הווידאו שעמד שם והקרין את המתרחש בכניסה, אנשים נוהרים לכיוון היציאה. חזרתי שוב על הכרזתי. לפתע רץ לעברי נרעש, איש אבטחה מבוגר, לפת את ידי ואמר, אסור לך לומר את זה. כשאמרתי לו שאין שום דבר שאוסר עליי לומר את זה, הוא אמר לי שוב שזה לא מאושר לי. מדוע? שאלתי. מפני שזה לא נכון, הוא השיב. עליך להפסיק לומר זאת מיד. That's like the security guy. <laughs> מובן שחזרתי על ההודעה פעם נוספת. האיש המסכן הזה באמת התחבט עם עצמו, מה לעשות איתי. הוא ידע שלא עברתי על שום חוק אמיתי, אך בכך שהטלתי ספק בסמכותו של המוסד, הפרתי חוזה חברתי בלתי כתוב. So I, I uh, teach that as an example of hacking in literature. Uh, yeah, Iran, but, uh, Iran your, your, your Hebrew is so good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm working on it, you know. <laughs> yeah, man, it's really coming along. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's, not so, it, it's not so popular in the world, so someone has to do it, you know. Um, yeah, so... Um, Uh, people are asking, uh, this was an improvisation. We didn't plan to read this, and it's kind of too long to show it on the, on the screen, but the next parts uh, are going to be on the screen. Um, so um, do you want to uh, kind of finish with the readings or go with the flow and read the, from the piece? We can do a few more things from theory, and then that'll be the end of, yeah. of, of poetry reading, thank God. So, so Kenneth will be reading from theory as a book of, how do you call them? Uh, segment? Uh, well, they're like aphorisms, and, and you, asked me what I, you asked me what I thought about Rupi Kaur. Right. I don't know what you want to add to that. Because my, the, my students this year, are, are there any students from this year? I, I don't see them on the first screen. Yes, there are. There are uh, yeah. We had a really serious discussion about Rupi Kaur. Yeah, she, yeah. I think she's terrific. I yeah. think she's terrific. She's an aphorist. And that means right. it's short and it's to the point and it, it actually means something. So I'm all for her. I think she's terrific. I, I totally agree, uh, although we analyzed it thoroughly uh, in class. But it's interesting, and I think we should mention that name. Uh, and, um, okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so I'll try to share from my screen. Uh, it's going to work, right? Um, <laughs> let's see. Do you see it? Yeah. You, yeah, sure. Yes. Colorful. I guess this is, remember this, seven years ago? <laughs> yeah, with the hacking group. That was great. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, can you see the entire screen? I think you perhaps have to move the, the window of the participants to this side. But if you can see it, you can start reading. But maybe we don't need to read it. I mean, it's on the screen. Everybody can read it. I mean, why do we need to read what's on the screen aloud? Isn't that redundant? Um, I think the, the vocal aspect. Oh, oh okay. The you know, we, we have a sound, a voice artist and a okay. composer here. So. Well, fortunately, fortunately, this is really short. Okay. We're all five short things. Ready? Go. I used to be an artist. Then I became a poet. Then a writer. Now when asked, I simply refer to myself as a word processor. I'll read it in Hebrew. I feel like uh, in the Olympic Games, when they moved to Soli to, to say the same thing in Arabic. פעם הייתי אומן, אז הפכתי משורר, ואז מחבר. היום כששואלים אותי, אני פשוט מתייחס לעצמי כאל מאבד תמלילים. See, these are fast. A child could do what I do, but wouldn't dare. Uh, but wouldn't dare to for fear of being called stupid. כל ילד יכול היה לעשות את מה שאני עושה, אבל אף ילד לא היה מעז לעשות כן, מתוך פחד שיקראו לו טיפש. We skim parse, bookmark, copy, paste, forward, share and spam. Reading is the last thing we do with language. אנחנו מרפרפים, מפרססים, מבקמרקים, מעתיקים, מדביקים, מפוורדים, משתפים ומספימים. קריאה היא הדבר האחרון שאנחנו עושים עם השפה. 
Easy is the new difficult. It is difficult to be difficult, but it is even more difficult to be easy. קל הוא הקשה החדש. קל, איך? סליחה, קל הוא הקשה החדש. קשה להיות קשה, אך קשה עוד יותר להיות קל. All text is used, soiled and worn. All language presenting itself as new is recycled. No word is virginal. No word is innocent. כל טקסט הוא משומש, מוכתם ובלוי. כל שפה שמציגה את עצמה כחדשה היא ממוחזרת. אף מילה אינה בתולית. אף מילה אינה חפה מפשע. That's the end of our poetry reading. That's the end of the reading, although... But we can you share wish, videos. Uh, don't you wish all poetry readings were that short? There's a, <laughs> an old line that goes, what's the best uh, 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 line in any poetry reading? And the answer is, and my last poem will be. <laughs> yeah, you saved the, the best for last, first of all. But uh, the thing is, um, people are paying for taxis. So you, you have to take into account the taxi to poem number ratio, I think. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, let's uh, talk about your work. And um, mm -hmm. I started here with uh, two of my most uh, favorite books. Uh, one of them is Uncreative Writing, about which you gave a workshop in Tel Aviv seven years ago. And the other one is Against Expression, and perhaps it would be better if you start uh, with this, uh, uh, an anthology uh, where uh, an anthology that you curated uh, together with Craig Dworkin about poems that are not expressive. And uh, I, I would like you to start with that. Well, I think we missed a lot. For example, we don't have your work in there. And I didn't know about your work in there. And one of the problems with uh, 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 curating a uh, English language uh, anthology is that you miss most of the work from the rest of the world. which is going on. And that was a huge blind spot. Um, um, I have a great advantage uh, writing in English. Um, I figure I wouldn't have had the career that I have uh, if uh, I was writing, say, in Hebrew. You know, I go to Scandinavia sometimes and uh, the Finns can't understand the Swedes. So they all speak English. You know, the Norwegians and the Icelandics don't understand each other. And so, um, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I want to acknowledge the, the great privilege that I've had. Look, at, I'm speaking English to a bunch of people for whom English is, their, is not their first language. And um, so, yeah, I, I uh, uh, you know, I think we kind of missed some things there. I think we, we, we called conceptual writing an international movement. Um, and I think it was much bigger than we gave it credit for being, and I, that's one of my regrets. Um, I think still in 2009 or so when we published this thing, um, or a, a 2009, I don't know, some, sometime around there, I think we were still thinking um, a little more, a little too locally. The world has gotten bigger since then. I would do it differently today. Uh, okay, but... Um... What, what uh, would you like to say about the, the, this notion of uncreative writing or the notion of uh, doing things that are not expressive, if you want to elaborate on that or sure. something else? Well, my, my, my thought is that no matter how hard we try, we are always expressing ourselves. Uh, uh, choice is expression, choice is authorship. Uh, I think uh, uh, poets try too hard to express themselves, whereas everything we do is, is, is expressive of ourselves. And I think if we could kind of rid that notion of expression and understand that expression was like the air, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd make our lives that much easier. Now, this is not a new idea. You know, all my ideas are old. I mean, this one comes from Cage or Duchamp or Warhol, you know. I mean, all I did, you know, in writing was take tired old art moves and bring them into poetry. Uh, many people found that quite controversial. Uh, however, um, to me it was obvious. It was just strange to think why, uh, why these moves hadn't been brought into poetry. I remember one time um, I was in Florence 
And I found a, I was with a very dear friend of mine who was a conceptual poet in Florence. And I walked into this bookshop and I found these beautiful boxes of Futuristi Manifesti, right? These perfect reprints of futurist manifestos. And there were boxes full. They were absolutely my favorite thing that I own. And um, I remember showing them with great excitement to my poet friend who said, what is futurism? I said, well, it was founded by F.T. Marinetti. <laughs> Who's Marinetti? Okay, so in other words, I thought, aha, if you can take all of these uh, uh, tired tropes of art from the 20th century and move them to the page, you might actually have some kind of new way of writing. And that coincided with the rise of the computer networks. Um, and so it all kind of came together in a weird way, like modernism began to make sense in the digital age in ways that it hadn't before. It was tired before the internet. The internet made modernism new again. Uh, I totally agree with what you said. Uh, you said that it was obvious uh, to you that this is going to happen. Um, the way I feel about it is that it's very intuitive. It's not something that you have to explain. It is just happening as you experience it. And uh, I would like to ask you uh, what, what's your take on, on, the, on that fact uh, in, in the backdrop of the internet. What in the internet has caused us to feel this way? Well, there's a very simple thing about the internet that not most people use all the time but don't recognize its power. And it's called copy and paste. And, uh, you know, I remember I, it was 1993 and I was sitting at my kitchen table in Soho and I had a little um, early, early little laptop computer and I was on a web browser called Lynx, L-Y-N-X, which was a Unix browser. It was all text based. And at the time I was writing number 111, my big early book. And I was collecting language that la ended in certain sounds. So, you know, for about three years, I just went um, around collecting sounds that ended in such and such a, uh, a letter. And, uh, oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how come, how, let me ask you something. How come we have this strange um, screen of my books up, but we don't have the, our faces on? Can uh, we go back to faces? Up the share. And yeah, then, uh, I think not, the books are, the, I, I'm much more interesting to look at than my books. Though I, you can want to see my books, you, they're right behind me. Look, there's all the books you want it, in the world. <laughs> uh, see, yeah, see, the uh, Rem, see the Rem Coolhouse books? Don't, one thing I love looking at um, when people are, are doing these Zoom things is to see what books they have on their shelves. So now you can see what I have on my shelf. There's, there's Ezra Pound back there. <laughs> you see him right above my thumb, the big uh, Humphrey Carpenter whole... biography of Ezra Pound, a serious character, and then moving up are those marvelous Rem Coolhouse books. Uh, and and right any one of me, the hosts... Uh, uh... Right behind me is Proust. Do you see where my thumb is? Those, those are, that's, that, there's two volumes of Proust. <laughs> Can anyone okay. of the hosts uh, spotlight uh, Kenneth's uh, screen so we can see the books behind him? Yeah. Oh, okay. or... It's so, not exactly so... working like that. Um, okay. Yeah. It... Oh, great. Look, now we can see them. Okay. There's, Rem, yeah. there's, there's the, the, the marvelous cool, you know, Project for the City books. See where my finger is? There's the Pound biography next to Burn Porter. There's a lot of Burn Porter. This one here. <laughs> That is a beautiful book. That's, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this one. <laughs> this is uh, The Catcher in the Rye, a novel by Richard Prince, <laughs> in which he, he, took, he took the entire, the, America's most lit valuable literary property, and anywhere there was the name of J.D. Salinger, uh, he simply put his own name in there. Isn't that, a, isn't that another brilliant move from Richard Prince? Okay, listen, so I have to talk about this thing that I was saying, get back to my story. I tend to diverge. Um, uh, so I'm sitting at my kitchen table on, on links and I'm writing this book and I've been collecting words and language by going around with a little pencil and listening and reading the newspaper and writing things down, sitting at movies, writing things down. And one day I'm, you know how when you're, uh, uh, on the internet and you're kind of nervous and you're kind of 
uh, run, running your mouse over the text, and you know how you kind of sometimes can grab it and move it around? Well, I was doing this on links, and I was kind of like grabbing the text in that way, and I pulled it too far, and it dropped into my Microsoft Word document. I went, oh, my God, wait a minute. What just happened there? And I just realized that, in fact, uh, the whole fucking thing can be copied. I said, wait, and it fell, and when it fell into my Microsoft Word document, it came in in the exact same font as my font, so I couldn't tell what was my writing, which of course never was really my writing, and the writing from the web. And at that point, I realized, this is 1993, I realized that writing would never be the same again. Now, of course, everybody seems to ignore this, this little thing, you know, everybody writes novels like it's 1950, you know, still because they want to make movies like it's 1950. But people still get caught up in these terrible plagiarism scandals, you know, like because uh, nobody wants to admit that everybody's copying and pasting everything. And so that's when I realized that the simple act of, of, of choosing and dragging into your own document can become an act of authorship. And that's 1993. That's a long time ago already. That's I don't even want to tell you how long ago that was. And I've been working, you know, I mean, I, I worked on that project for about 20 years. Yeah. And, and UberWeb is, is now, it's, it's since 1996. Yeah, yeah. You know, UberWeb is older than Google. Wow. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I, I would like, th there are many uh, questions that popped out uh, as you went. Um, the first of which, and, and I know, uh, two questions, two quick questions. First of all, was your computer a Mac or a Windows? It's interesting back then with the yeah, link. Yeah. Uh, no, I, had, I always had a Mac, you know, I, okay. I was an artist. So, so, and Windows were so retarded back then, yeah. you know, Windows that, 90, that, NT or Windows 95. I mean, I used them, but um, they were, they were really bad back then. But, you know, I, I ditched my, uh, I ditched my iPhone for an Android. I love, I love, uh, I love my Android. I think it's much better than the iPhone now. Uh, so, so uh, I'm done with that. I'm done with the iPhone. I love the Android. Uh, okay, great. Uh, I love the Android as well. Um, just some comments here because it's it's crazy. Uh, someone said that he wrote The Catcher in the Rye uh, in high school, but it's not a it's not the same author. And someone asked me whether I'm a relative of Israel's weather guy, <laughs> Donny Roop. No. <laughs> Why is that? And uh, a, a lot of people are talking about uh, wishing to see, rather than your books, uh, uh, your, your clothing department, your apparel. <laughs> well, well that, we'll do another version of that. This was supposed to be yeah. about poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you one thing. My friend makes these ties. These are old rep ties. If you can see really closely, it says 1960 on it. And this is a Princeton tie. And my friend takes them and he cuts them up and re-sews them. You see this little, this whole like lich? Amazing. Um, and he, he thought he could get very rich doing these ties, going to thrift shops and getting very bad old ties and making beautiful ties out of them. And he wanted to charge $400 for them and sell them at Barney's. But of course, nobody's gonna pay $400 for a tie. So he stopped making them and he gave his, all of the old ones to me. So I've got the most beautiful ties in the world. I, I really want to ask you about your new book, your upcoming book. But before okay. that, I just want just another question uh, referring to that, uh, because your book is also referring to that in its title, but we'll get back to that, to fashion. Uh, but We're almost done here. We've only got a half hour left. So Yeah, yeah um, but it's interesting, you know. Uh, it's an interesting conversation. I, I, I don't know whether people understand what we're talking about, but uh, I don't know. Um, okay, so, let's um, focus. We only have a half hour. Let's go. So let's see if I can share my screen. And um, oh, not this again. I, I want to discuss this suit. Okay. Uh, and it was done by uh, the president, uh, Taylor, right? The, the guy who made suits for Barack Obama. Well, I mean, yes and no. <laughs> um, that suit is, is from Tom Brown, and it's uh, f uh, uh, for a line that he did for um, Brooks Brothers Black Fleece. Of course, I couldn't afford real Tom Brown clothes, but he did kind of a cool 
a line. And, and, and uh, what Tom Brown was so brilliant at doing was taking a preppy style and, um, and, and making it all wrong. So like, if you look closely, those are, um, um, that's, that's a preppy, uh, that's a, uh, I can't remember what those things are called on the suit, but they're preppy. And the idea was that Obama being the perfect prep would recognize the preppiness of the clothes um, and say, but there's something wrong about this, which he absolutely did. Um, and I, I wore two suits to the White House by Tom Brown. Um, and, and, and he said to me, when I wore the suit, he looked at me and he said, I would love to wear a suit like that, but my handlers wouldn't let me. And uh, to I, which I, said to, I said to him, I said, with all due respect, Mr. President, there's some ways in which being a poet is preferable to being the president of the <laughs> <laughs> he was a nice guy. He was yeah. lovely. I we, uh, we really miss him. <laughs> you said another thing about him coming uh, to the room and saying, uh, "Behave yourselves." Oh yeah, uh, just just you know, it was really weird. Um, just as about the poetry reading was supposed to start at the White House, uh, all the poets and the uh, musicians they had rappers. You know, that was a really great group of people. We're all sitting in the green room, and for, through which Obama had to pass before he went out on the stage. And all of a sudden, you know, the th event's about to start, and the voice of God goes, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And he passes through the room, and he looks at us with a big smile. He says, you guys behave yourself. And everybody's waiting for the President to go out, and then he comes back in, and he says, you're artists. Don't behave yourself. And then he went out. So, I mean, this guy was, you know, this guy was wonderful. You know, the, the current shithead in, 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 in the office has not even had uh, any artist except for Kanye West, I think, and maybe a country singer. So there's no arts anymore in America. Uh, yeah. Uh, on that note, uh, let's move to your Iran? upcoming book. Iran? Yeah. Uh, okay, you, you're not showing the video. Okay. I'm not showing the video. I'm showing the video, um, yeah. Yeah, but I just want uh, to go to the video. It's precious time. We don't want to waste it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just glancing through your uh, photos from your residency at the MoMA as the first uh, Poet Laureate. The first uh, and only. And there was never another one. <laughs> yeah, uh, so far. And uh, you write... No, never. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> true. Although Frank O'Hara was a poet working there, uh, making uh, phone work calls work. to send to to sell uh, tickets, right, or something like that. It was a horrible experience being the poet laureate okay. of MoMA. They couldn't give a fuck about poetry, and they were so upset. The cur that 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 that, that uh, I was brought in by education, and the education department of any museum are considered to be the gym teachers of the art world. Do you know <laughs> what I mean by that? <laughs> Do you understand that? Does that translate into Israel? It, it, it's totally translatable, uh, although um, I think you, you mention it in your new book as uh, you have this, uh, the, the beginning of the book, the book starts with something called the back door, right? So, yeah, uh, well, MoMA, you know, MoMA, it was weird. I, uh, I was brought in by the uh, education department and they kind of gave me an all access pass, like I could do anything I wanted, like night at the museum shit. And, um, I thought the most radical thing would be to bring poetry into the galleries because if you wanted to, um, if, 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 if any of you wanted to go to MoMA and stand in front of a uh, Baccioni painting or something and declaim a futurist poem, you would be escorted out of the gallery. Uh, so I thought, well, let's bring the voice and let's bring uh, literature into the gallery where it has been prohibited. So we did that every single week. And I know Karen was there making beautiful drawings almost every week of, of it. Uh, I enriched it, but not, during my tenure, not a single member of the curatorial staff came. Um, the only people that showed up were the guards. And they, the guards were the heart and soul of that institution. They were the most wonderful people. Um, uh, they were the people that knew everything. They knew more about the art than anybody. There was a big... I don't know, it's a big corporation. It's a horrible place, MoMA. And I have to say they did the rehanging recently and they made it more expansive and it is very good and it's much more inclusive and it still feels like MoMA. I think they did a great job, but it's a nice place to visit. I wouldn't want to work there again. 
Okay, great. Most people who are joining us are interested in Ubu Web. And the mm. good news is that there's a new book that you wrote, which is basically about Ubu Web. And uh, it's titled Duchamp, or Dushan, depends on where you come from, is my hey, lawyer. What is it in Israel? What are they, how do they say it in Israel? Dushan. Like Dushan? Dushan from uh, Greece, from the Serb guy. Oh, lovely. Dushan. Right. How's my Hebrew, Dushan? I, I remember your speech in Hebrew from 2013. <laughs> uh, everyone remembered that. Yeah, that was, that was right. <laughs> I, okay. I appropriated it for my robot. But, uh, <laughs> it's not about me this time. Uh, I'm sorry for your robot. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so tell us about the, the book. I, I mean, uh, you sent it to me two days ago and I read it and I think it's, it's amazing. It's your best work because it's, it's about the heart of your creation. It's about your baby, Ubu Web. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I figured I'm getting old and it was time to write the story of something that's been around for a quarter of a century. Um, and it, I, I figured I'd better get it down before I forgot it. So I whipped together this little book um, that tells all the deep and dark, dark little secrets of, of UberWeb, like how the fuck have you done this by breaking copyright for 25 years and you've never been sued? You've never used money? How can you run a website without any money? How can you share things without people's permission, no permission? How can you do all the things you do? And in this book, I spill the beans. So just for the people who are getting half sentences, uh, could you please just tell the story from the beginning? I'll, I'll just say that UbuWeb is ah. probably the world's largest avant-garde archive or probably even archive of art, maybe except for some uh, really large uh, corporations of museums. Well, the Louvre has, I think, more, more things. But you built in your <laughs> own fingers uh, the largest or one of the largest avant-garde archives, wh which started as an archive for poetry, for visual right, poetry. Right, right. But it, so, it so tell us the story for people who are not familiar with it. And then right. We'll move on. right. Well, um, UberWeb uh, started 25 years ago. Um, it started for visual and concrete poetry. I threw a couple of old, dusty concrete poems up on the web, and they looked beautiful when they were backlit by the screen. And I thought, wow, you know, maybe there's a second life for this stuff that nobody cared about. So I started putting that up, which led to wanting to put up some sound poetry, if you know what sound poetry is. Um, and then I put up those files, and at a certain point, um, I had this huge archive of visual, concrete, and sound poetry. And then I started putting up the work of John Cage. And sometimes John Cage would like read his uh, texts on top of an orchestra. And I thought, or sometimes it would be an orchestra on top of Cage's text. And I thought, well, wait a minute. This isn't really sound poetry, and this isn't really orchestral music. It's sort of both, and it's sort of this weird hybrid. So I then decided to expand the site to become a site of the avant-garde, for lack of a better word. Um, and then, so I just began throwing things up there. And at this point, there's um, hundreds of thousands of MP3s, uh, 5,000 films. I don't know, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, it's really not, the content is very easy. Um, but maintaining that content and putting it up there is much, keeping it up there is much more difficult. And I think the project re is really about copyright. Uh, I, I break copyright. I've broken copyright for 25 years. Everything that's up there is unpermissioned, illegal. Uh, it's been swiped, shared, and stolen, and repurposed from other places and put together up there. I've never been sued, uh, never even come close to being sued. Uh, the site uh, uh, vociferously uh, and loudly uh, proclaims that it takes no money at all. Uh, I figured if I was taking money, I should pay people. Uh, if I was getting rich off of this, so should everyone else. So then I decided long ago that there would be no money. And um, yeah, that's sort of the story. It's a big, it's, a, it's an enormous site of the avant-garde, but it's all fucked up because I'm a poet, man. I know nothing about the avant-garde. I'm not an art historian. I have a BFA in sculpture, right? From, from an art RISD. From RISD. Which is a lot. One class. Uh, yeah. I took one class in art history uh, uh, as an undergraduate, and it was in Baroque art. 
I fucking don't know what I'm doing. No, but, but so you're stuck what... with a very bad, broken thing. But if you really wanted to do this legitimately and permission everything and do it right, uh, it would cost millions of dollars today to do. So we're stuck with this giant authoritative archive that has no fucking clue of what it, of 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 what it is or what it wants to do. And uh, that's the beauty. Uh, yeah, uh, right. But uh, I would like to ask you uh, a little deeper question, dive deeper into that. Um, in your book, you're uh, dealing with uh, uh, Shoshana Zuboff's uh, term of uh, surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. And basically, you uploaded it to uh, Ubu Web, stuff that no one uh, was interested in, in uh, capitalistic uh, terms, you know. Uh, when you uploaded uh, stuff by William S. Burroughs, it wasn't Naked Lunch. It was the, the other stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so my, my question is whether um, there's something about UbuWeb that challenges capitalism. And what's the way, oh, how do you see it? Uh, because you write it in the book and you <laughs> hint, you, you give some hints to, to that. It's been anti-capitalism, anti-consumerism, uh, uh, for, for a quarter of a century. I mean, but if you wanted to sell these things, you couldn't sell them. <laughs> you know, as I say, uh, 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 intellectually priceless, uh, uh, economically worthless, you know. I mean, but, you couldn't, you know, weird, weird, weird electronic and avant-garde film, there's no market for that stuff. So give it away, share it with people. But so many people, well, I don't know if so many people, but several people has, have told me, not you, me, thank God for UbuWeb during Corona. You know, it's like well, people it, are, are yeah. fed up with uh, the stuff that you've got on these Reddit Netflix, for instance. You know, you have so much and uh, it, it's kind of like this uh, movie uh, by Spielberg, uh, Minority Report where this guy goes inside a shopping mall and all the ads uh, are uh, custom customized to show him what he wants. And uh, it feels that we're inside this uh, filter bubble and you know, all of this. And UbuWeb Ubu gives you something else. And I think that you, you wrote something about it in, in the book that uh, people are cursing computer algorithms for building the same taste for everyone, you know, the, the same preferences or recommendations, but algorithms can also be built in order to give you something else, to be alternative. And why not go with this flow? Well, I think it, it's funny because uh, once, once uh, coronavirus came, there suddenly were a million articles just rediscovering this thing called UbuWeb. You know, of course, they, they forgot about it for 25 years or didn't give a fuck about it when when you could you know, go to bookstores and movie theaters and things like that. Um, you know, it's always just, the avant-garde is something you can't um, make people like. You have to have a need in your life for it. Something has to have gone very wrong with the way things are in order for you to be attracted to the avant-garde. Um, and so when you find a need, so I, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm religious, I'm, I'm saying something religious here, but when you find a need, you will come to that and you will drink from that well and it'll soothe your soul. And that's why, you know, I, I do believe in, in, in art or avant-garde as being a sort of religion because it can provide the things, the, the capitalism, the consumerism, the fashion, you know, I play with fashion, but quite frankly, it's just, you know, uh, these are, you know, what's behind me there. I mean, those are, those, those are the things that really matter. Um, and, and it's always there, but it's only going to be a few of us that need that. You have to, things have, something really wrong has had to happen in your life in order for you to be interested in this stuff. Most people say, what the fuck is that? That's useless. And it's this uselessness that it's beauty. I think it was Auden that said, you know, poetry makes nothing happen. And I think that's such a beautiful statement. I think it's a complicated statement. Um, I think poetry's beauty is that it does make nothing happen. Capitalism makes everything happen. It insists poetry by making nothing happen jams the systems, jams the cogs of capitalism. Um, and therefore, when you try to harness poetry to make something happen, you actually betray poetry. Poetry's beauty is its stasis. 
its stasis is its resistance. It's non-commodifiable. You can't do anything with poetry. It's valueless, and that's its value. And in a hyper-capitalist society, that's the most valuable thing that we can do. To me, that's resistance. So the festival asks, uh, on that note, uh, whether you think that poetry books should be free. All my books have been free. I mean, I, I, you know, I let the publisher have about a year with them, and they never make any money anyway. And then I release them on file sharing, and they're read. You know, everything's read. Um, they're not read, you know, otherwise, yeah. I mean, I, you know, listen, pop, I give small press poetry publishers, you know, man, their hearts are in the right place. Uh, give them a little while with the book, see what they can do with it. But quite frankly, after a certain number of months even, there's no sales and that's that. And now you have to give the work away. But so let's happen. talk about, let's talk about Manoscope and the shadow libraries. Uh, shadow libraries. So, you know, love happens. You know, we, we, we form communities around the world, not based on capital, like selling books. I mean, you know, they should be free, but we meet the way we met in Israel. Um, uh, uh, we, we, you know, we, we share community of love and that's what UberWeb is. It's a worldwide community of people like ourselves. Um, uh, who are drawn together by a certain need, not by a, a transactionalism or economy, but by passion, alienation, and love. Uh, last time we physically met uh, was when we were hosted by our mutual friend, amazing artist, Ilan Manoach, who is not Israeli at all, despite the name. Uh, and uh, it, it was during the, the uh, Shadow Libraries Symposium. Would you like to elaborate on what a shadow library is and what was in the symposium? Just briefly, and then I don't, we have to like conclude. Did we want to take questions or something? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I'll, I can do this quickly, but I talk a lot about this in the book. Google Web is a shadow library. Shadow libraries are, are libraries that develop in the shadow of real libraries. The problem with real libraries is they're defunded. Uh, often uh, uh, you don't have access to them, say your real library when you're a university student, as long as you have a valid ID, you can use things in that library. The minute you are, are out of school, you're shit out of luck for a library. The libraries in New York are shelled. So a number of people around the world have created shadow libraries, libraries in the shadow that offer free uh, intellectual and cultural artifacts to people that need them. And th these are the, you know, there's many, many library genesis, uh, ARG, Monoscope, UberWeb, I mean, these are all our friends. And it's a circle of shadow libraries. So um, it's social and it's political. Yeah, your books are mostly available on Monoscope, right? Or sure, you know, I mean, you know, I, yeah, and I give them to Duchamp to, to put there. For fuck's sake, yes. Poetry books should be free. There's no economy around poetry. Why? Get rid of it, man. And also stop being capitalist about your fucking poetry. No, you know, it's not about that. You, you, you're missing it, man, if you, if, if you think that, that this is the wrong way to get rich. Uh, believe me. Uh, you know, I have a day job. You know, we, we, we work day jobs. So that's, that's, that's an occupational hazard of being a poet. Nobody lives off of poetry. As a matter of fact, I remember at the end of his life, John Ashbery, America's most awarded poet, and he was a friend of mine. We were doing a collaboration together and John was broke. He had won MacArthur grants and National Book Awards and every other thing under the sun. And at the end of his life, it was broke. Poetry always ends badly. There are no good endings for poetry, for any of them, even mainstream poets. So um, I, I think that the only thing to do is to give the books, is to give poetry away for free. And hopefully someone is willing to accept them. Uh, there are a lot of- no, no, That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. See, people say, you know, they get so upset on UberWeb. You're bootlegging my work. How dare you? I say, if your work is good enough to be bootlegged, then you're, you've succeeded beyond anybody's wildest expectations for what art can possibly do. You're a success. Somebody cares about you enough to bootleg you. That's like, wow, most artists have nobody interested. Next time somebody pirates your work, you should thank them. That's about the best you're going to do. Great. There, there are a lot of great questions from the audience here. And uh, some are technical, so you can contact me, and I'll give you a list of websites, uh, et cetera. And some are from, are from my friends, so uh, I don't want to uh, 
give them an advantage, but the, the first question is from Neely Kuffler, who is a big fan of yours. She asks, what moment or feeling are you seeking as an artist? And when do you feel you have found it or nailed it? Oh, wow. Like, uh, well, I, you know, to me, it's the machine that builds the work. So if I can build a really good machine, then I know any kind of thing I pour into it, it'll come out really well. So I don't focus so much on the, on the result and I don't, you know, I, I, I focus, I, and I don't focus on what goes into the machine, but if I have a concept, it's gotta be a really tight machine. I pour text into it, it comes out the other side. It can't fail. The machine is well built. So I, I'm not interested in inspiration in that way. I'm interested in process rather than inspiration. Uh, our mutual friend, Lior Zalmansen. Uh, ah, I love him. Hello, Lior. Me too. Yeah. He asks, uh, how, do, how do you experience online learning these days? Have you find new ways to waste time on Zoom? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's great. I mean, I, I, I watch a lot of stuff that's been archived. I, I'm, I'm finding that the talks around uh, D-I-E-M, D-I-E-M, the Democracy and European Movement, uh, 25 is has a bunch of really good things and uh, the are you know the best thinkers in the world are getting up there and talking about the uh, uh, the problems of capitalism and 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 disease and virus I mean they're very good it's D I E M on YouTube 25 movement uh, and it's a great it's democracy in in uh, in in European Union movement which is a very important one they try it's a leftist coalition that's trying to keep the uh, EU together, and they're very sane. So that I find, I've, I've been finding a lot of good stuff from from them lately, and yeah, it's carrying me through. This is terrific. A lot of great new content is coming up. A question from Lani Manka. Perhaps you know him. Yeah. Hey. So he he asks whether you can speak about Warhol's uh, a a novel and Anton Tuckbo Anton's Tuck Bones, uh, well, which. Yeah. Do you like more, and what does you what do you think about the relationship between them and your own work? That's yeah, a great. Well, those are those are great books. You know, um, speech. Um, you know, William Carlos Williams talked about the poetry and average speech. Speech of Polish mothers, as he said, is is really the best poetry in the world. <laughs> and O'Hara, you know, his O'Hara, you know, I do this and then I do that in plain English. But what happens is Anton and Warhol up that ante by making real speech poetry. And so poetry, which, you know, which, which uh, uh, you know, has always sort of been this precious little bubble is now, or by these artists, have, has just been brought. So it, it, in other words, everything I say is poetry if I claim it as being such. And that's, a, that's, that's, that's just a really democratic idea about about poetry and um so i'm i'm interested in that if i may uh, add to that uh anton anton's talk poems work really well like as the ideal input for machine learning algorithms which is interesting the it's thing like, i love about anton is that he made them better because if you listen to david's raw talks they're really brilliant but they're not that good he went back in and he tinkered with them and he you know and i think that's cool because if you accept what the machine gives you you're going to get a lot of garbage the signal to noise ratio is wrong and i think this is a problem that a lot of poets working with machine language uh, uh accept what the machine gives them and walk away from it i think you got to kind of get in there and monkey around make it make it a little better but don't tell anyone you're doing it they go wow that's a great machine you built <laughs> I like cheating. I'm interested in cheating. I agree. Uh, I'm a I, cheater. Someone, uh, Nicked Dot Kra, asks whether you see yourself as Joyce, nice hat, uh, probably because of the Uberweb uh, site, and in which ways do you see similarities? To well, um, we, we, we both uh, are connected to Trieste. Uh, I just recently bought a house right right by Trieste, so I, I joined the great group of uh, many artists uh, who have spent time in that marvelous uh, Central European city. Um, I don't know, Finnegan's Wake is the best book ever written. There's been no book. That and the Arcades Project are the two best books, you know, from the 20th century. And uh, I, 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 if I can write something, you know, that they're kind of, yeah, they're, they're hugely inspirational, man. Those guys are, are marvelous, you know, so uh yeah joyce 
No, uh, when I was teaching at Princeton back in maybe 2009 or 2010, there, Joyce was not on the syllabus anywhere in the English department. He didn't exist. He's really out of fashion. I think it's great to go, you know, you have to pay attention to things that nobody else is paying attention to, and then you can be cool. Oh, I think that you should be in fashion all the time. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Our, our, ten, our 10 friends feel, that, feel the same way, but you know, okay. Uh, maybe you know Ravid Ravner. She's an amazing woman, the most amazing yes. woman. Yes, I do. Uh, and she asks about the concept of avant-garde and modernist notion, meaning turning your back on past works. And so, oh, how can you reconcile this avant-garde and supporting plagiarism as a paradigm for art? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, you know. You're a lawyer, I guess. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, like, like exactly. Uh, you know, plagiarism and appropriation, recontextualization. I mean, all of these things were part of the avant-garde, you know, but it wasn't a part of the avant-garde that anybody really liked because it brought up sticky ideas of morality and people don't like complicated ideas of morality. You know, how can you like Ezra Pound and be a Jew? You know, this is, how can you hold those two, those two thoughts in your, in, in, in conflicting thoughts in your mind at one time? The cognitive dissonance of that is really what the avant-garde is. Most people can't do that, but I think the avant, people that love the avant-garde can understand um, contradictory uh, terms and reconcile them. And so, so I, I have no problem with that. I, there are many bad people that have been really great artists that I love, myself included. Okay, well, we're about to conclude soon. Um, I was wondering whether you would like to read another thing, or maybe uh, we can watch a part of the no, uh, White House reading, or? No. Uh, so, so read it, read for us, please. <clears throat> read something? Yeah, no? please. All right, all right, all right. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Just very, very briefly, I will read uh, something from, from my new book, from Duchamp is My Lawyer. And, you know, I don't, uh, maybe it's, you know, you know, it's, it's a poetry. I can't tell the difference between anything anymore. I, I guess like Ubu Web is a big poem, you know, so I guess I can read this. I'm going to, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to read a, the, the story. The, the very beginning of the book is a, a marvelous story about a, re, a, a radical renegade librarian um, in, in, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art, which I normally hate, as I told you. But um, I'll read this, the, the very beginning of the book, the intro, because it's, it's a great story, and then we'll stop there. It's very short. Um, okay, so this is what, what um, Iran was talking about. Uh, there's a back door to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City that few know about. Invisible to the bustling crowds at the main entrance on 53rd Street, it's desolate except for the occasional noisy school group or quiet academic researcher entering and exiting. There's no admission fees or snake and queues and only a lonely intern that sits at a desk. And if you sign in and take the elevator to the top floor, you'll find the MoMA Library. And it was there in the late 1970s that a librarian named Clive Philippot created a policy unlike any other in the history of the museum. Okay, this is really interesting, this guy. Without asking permission, he decreed that anybody could mail anything to the MoMA library and it would be accepted and become part of the official collection. There was no limit to what could be sent, nor were there any specifications made to size, medium, or provenance. No judgments were made about quality either. The artist could be world famous or completely unknown. It made no difference. And once something was sent, no questions were ever asked. Whatever was received was accepted. And now this is an amazing thing. Philippot estimates that between 1977 and 1994, he got anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 artists into the MoMA collection this way. Uh, Bob Dylan once said I had gotten in the door when no one was looking. I was in there now and there was nothing anybody could ever do about it again. And similarly, Philippot's gesture was so under the radar that the front door, the museum administration and curatorial wing, paid no attention to it. And once they did, it was too late. Nobody was going to return all those crates and boxes that had piled up over the years, never remind uh, never mind uh, removing hundreds 
of thousands of artists from the database. And while some of the artifacts from that acquisition collection are quite valuable and on display in the galleries, most of them languish in MoMA's remote storage facility out in Queens, stacked up in the boxes that they were originally sent in. And they're still all part of the MoMA collection. Come on, isn't that fucking great? Isn't that inspirational? Fucking got 200,000 artists, 150,000 artists in that way. And the great thing is that every one of those artists can tell their mother, every poet that sends something in, that poet can say to their mother, I'm in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And your mother goes, ah, oh, you're a success. You know, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's just such a, it's all we need, we need so little but it's so beautiful and so democratic and it's so open and it's so radical and it's so subversive. If those guys tried to get in the front door, they would have been repelled by the guards, say, get a fuck out of here. Okay, so that's it. It's all about the back door. Thank Sneaker, God for the back man. door. Thank God for Ubu Web. Thank God for Kenneth Goldsmith. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. This was fun. I love, I love all you. I hope to see you in Israel sometime. It's been many years since I've been there but I don't think anybody's going anywhere for the time. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.